I think the evil hiding in the dark has always existed. It seems like they've come forward in recent decades. Maybe it's technology and the explosion of population. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe they've been unleashed. Said E. What I'm about to share is 100% true and a vital part of the fight against the Neph and other creatures. You deserve to know that there are elements within the government that are fighting for you. You also deserve to know that elements within the government are working against you. Will you be ready to fight? Day 2, Afghanistan, 2009 I dreamt the most vivid and lucid dream the night after we killed the beast. I was dead, standing in some unnatural place. It was pitch black, stretching for an eternity. The only light in this place emanated from my body. I felt like I was floating, like my body did not physically exist. I ran in every direction, screaming for help, never seeing another soul or light. I finally gave up, sitting down, ready to spend eternity in isolation. I suddenly began to sense the same fear and despair that I felt in the presence of the giant we had killed. Please, God, no, I thought, on cue. The giant walked out of the darkness. It looked the same, but its eyes were now yellow with red pupils. It bent down to look me in the eyes, licking its lips and giving me a look of disgust. You sent me to this place, you and your filthy god. Now that you're here, I will make you pay for eternity. It said, as its hands was inches from snatching me up, I saw a flash of light dart between us. I shot upward, hearing the beast yell a guttural cry of agony. I was suddenly back in my bed, drenched in sweat, feeling like I had just gone somewhere I should not have been. Vasquez, asleep in the other room, awoke to the sound of freedom being delivered at Mach 2. The shipping container I'm in rattles so hard that my gear falls off the hooks on the wall. Bagram is one of two main US coalition air bases in Afghanistan, so jets and bombers take off at all hours of the night. Son of a bitch, shut the hell up, Staff Sergeant Vasquez yells, as he throws something at the ceiling, leaning over a plywood wall, smiling and stroking my hair. Wake up, young one. I threaten to bash his skull in, knowing full well he can snap me like a twig. He laughs and slowly lowers below the plywood. The sun is barely up and the temperature is already in the mid-90s. My fire-resistant ACUs make it feel 20 degrees hotter. I squint, keeping my eyes down to avoid the rising sun while putting my Oakleys on. In the daylight, it becomes apparent that I stick out like a sore thumb. Everyone around me wears whatever they want. Most have baseball caps on and have beards. Some have uniforms on with no identifying patches. Some wear cargo pants and polos. I'm one of the few in ACUs. My bat scroll on my left arm, clean shaven and short hair. Rangers are one of the few spec op units that wear uniforms and abide by shaving and hair length standards. I'm 24 and a second lieutenant. The gold bar on my chest might as well be a bullseye. Being a second lieutenant in bat is like being a freshman that is captain of the varsity football team. I technically outrank the enlisted soldiers and NCOs, but I lean heavily on them for mentorship. I prepare myself for the daily hazing rituals, knowing I better be ready to laugh at myself. I step into the talk to check in with Lieutenant Colonel Williams, who is leaning over a soldier staring at a computer screen that is showing troop movements. Activity in the talk is much slower today. Most soldiers stand behind screens, dipping or drinking coffee. Some are talking about football, 
Others look like zombies in need of a break. The place feels different than the night before. I wonder how much they actually know about what happened the previous night. They couldn't know, or they wouldn't be at peace. There's no going back from what I saw. It was weighing on me heavily. Lieutenant Colonel Williams interrupts my thoughts, nodding at me and motioning for me to follow him. He is tall, 6'4", thin, with graying hair on his temples. He looks like he probably runs marathons, but has a slight limp. Word is that he had lost most of his right calf in an IED attack. He still walks so fast that I had to power walk to keep up. He pulls me into the conference room and tells me to sit down. Lieutenant, Captain Stone told me you did a great job last night and that I can trust you. The way he said trust you led me to believe there was more behind what he was saying. I'm giving first platoon to another lieutenant that is en route. I started to object, but he holds his hands up to stop me. This is not a punishment. You'll get a platoon eventually. For now, you're taking over the PSD team and you'll augment some of the team guys while they're recovering from the last few months. He gives me a look of reassurance that lets me know there is more to this. I thank him and accept my fate. He tells me to get unpacked and settled and that he'll find me for my next mission. He hands me a phone, saying, It's secure. Well, it's secure from the Hajis. I wonder what he means by secure from the Hajis. I didn't understand who else we needed secure comes from at the time. I leave the talk dejected. PSD are the three letters that most don't want to hear when deployed. PSD stands for Personnel Security Detachment. It's the military's less fancy version of what you see the Secret Service doing on TV. It's a great job when you're in garrison. I've planned and led the security for multiple presidents and even for the Queen of England during visits throughout the West. But while deployed, I want a platoon. I want to be the blunt instrument, not the bulletproof vest. I couldn't shake the feeling I got from him though. He was trying to tell me something. And telling me I was augmenting team guys was really strange. That's not typically something an officer would do. We're leaders and managers, not extra guns. Also, team guys normally don't get augmented unless something catastrophic happens. The next month went by in a blur, as I spent 16 hours a day escorting general officers and high-ranking politicians around Afghanistan. I sat in on meetings that decided the fate of the nation. I fought through a couple of attacks on our principles, narrowly missed a VBIED, and even took a round to the arm. None of it seemed to matter though. It wasn't even exciting. I spent most days thinking about what that giant was and thinking that I should be hunting the real evil of this world. It's like the Neff left a scar on my soul. I couldn't shake it from my thoughts. And where the hell was David in 357? He said he would talk to me about the giants they killed. But I haven't seen them since my first night in country. Then, something happened that changed my life. Forever. A few guys walk into my office. Two of the guys look completely out of place. They have khakis and black polos on that say CBTI. Both are a bit plump. They aren't CIA operatives and clearly aren't soldiers. The third is a spook. He has on cargo pants, a black polo and a black cap. He has the look. Spooks stick out like a sore thumb. The spook shakes my hand and takes his cap and sunglasses off, introducing himself as Jake. He looks like a legitimately good guy. He has bald and gray hair, is about 5'10 and has the friendliest smile you'll ever see. He looks like everyone's favorite uncle. He isn't being distant and isn't talking to me like I'm retarded. A far cry from the CIA asshats that I had interacted with thus far. 
he looks me in the eye and says, Mike, I'm going to be needing you and Vasquez for the next couple of months to run security for an operation we have going on. It's jarring to hear my first name. As far as I know, only Lieutenant Colonel Williams is aware that my name is Mike. I try to hide my angst and ask, What for, sir? What's the mission? I need to run it by Lieutenant Colonel Williams since we're the only dedicated SOCOM PSD team in the area. Absolutely, run it by your boss, but it's already been settled. He's aware, he says. He's avoiding my question about the mission. What's the mission entail? I've got a 10-man team, so I need specifics to allocate the proper number of personnel. I said. Jake responded. Just you and Vasquez. This gentleman will fill you in on the mission. He gets up and gives me a very nerdy fist bump, smiling, and says, I'll see you boys at 1900. Meet me at the helipads. We're going to be working nights. He then walks out of the talk without glancing back. The other two guys fill us in on the basics. We're going to be dropping orbs around the country to, uh, to test out a new technology we developed. I know at that point to stop asking questions. I'm not going to get anything from them. They leave the talk and Vasquez gives me a funny look. Who the hell were those two? I ask. Jake is clearly a spook, but those two look like they work at my uncle's engineering firm. Vasquez filled me in on CIA contractors. The three-letter agencies hire a lot of civilians for technology development, implementation, and intelligence gathering. CIA contractors are much more rampant than you realize. If you have worked at a major engineering firm or technology provider to the DoD, then you've worked with or for someone that has been contracted by the CIA at some point. You've clearly picked up the distrust between the Spec Ops community and CIA. It's not always that way. There are a lot of great CIA agents that try to take care of us. The problem is that the majority of joint CIA Spec Ops missions leave one side wanting for intel, and that's always the Spec Ops side. We're generally treated like blunt instruments, whose only value is to hammer the nail. I would distrust them, even if they hadn't fucked us over by failing to inform us of the giant. Our missions and core beliefs are just vastly different. The Spec Ops community works in the shadows to eliminate threats to the United States and our allies. We can't publicly share what we do, but we have zero interest in misleading the general public. I don't want you to have to worry about the evil people and creatures of this world. But honestly, I would like for that to be your choice. When dealing with the NEFs, there were good and bad elements within the CIA. It just took us a while to see which side most were on. I talked to Lt. Colonel Williams, who confirmed what Jake said. Vasquez and I were tasked out to Jake and his team for the next couple of months. He said something strange as I was leaving the talk. LT, Jake is one of the good guys. Trust him entirely and ensure he comes back in one piece. I step out into the bright sun, throwing my patrol cap and Oakley's on. I stare off into space, thinking about what he said. Why would he tell me a CIA agent is one of the good guys, and to trust him entirely? Aren't we all on the same team? The CIA can be dicks, but they're still on our side, right? I meet Jake on the helipad at 1900. The sun is starting to go down. I recognize the gunner. He was in the 160th helicopter that picked us up after we killed the giant. He nods at me as we board the Black Hawk. The rotors push us upward, the helicopter rocking forward a bit as we lift it to a few hundred feet in seconds, the nose stabilizing as we speed forward. There is always something comforting about riding in Blackhawks. For some reason, I get a better rush from leaning out the door than I do jumping out of a plane. It doesn't hurt that the 160th has the best pilots in the world. My pilot, John, is a warrant officer 3 
and an artist in the sky. We shoot forward, flying up of the earth, 200 miles per hour, just above the tree line. I clip a carabiner to my belt and pants, leaning out the door, feeling like I could reach down and touch the top of the trees. We sneak in and out of the canyons, helicopter pitch black, as John flies only aided by knots. We travel for about an hour, as I hear Jake say, Right here, put it down above that cave. We step out of the bird, Vasquez and I sprinting in opposite directions, diving into the prone and facing the tree line. One of the engineers pulls a small robot out that looks like the kind you see bomb squads use in the States. Using a remote control, he wheels it down the cave opening. It's carrying a large crate of small orbs that look like they are full of wiring. The robot returns and we all load the Blackhawk, flying up into the brisk mountain air. Periodically, the engineers drop loads of orbs off the side of the Blackhawk. No one speaks the entire trip. They just monitor their computers, which Vasquez and I aren't allowed to view. This happened every night for the next couple of months. For 12 hours, we headed out over the countryside, dropping orbs and sending the robot into caves. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Vasquez and I were frustrated because we were wasting valuable time in country, staring the tops of trees and pulling security for a robot. Most nights, we didn't even return to Bagram. We landed at some desolate FOB, leaving from there the following night. Jake would smoke cigars with me after missions. He would talk about his family back home, or about how he joined the CIA to protect America and reveal the truth. Truth with a capital T, he would say. He had a necklace, a crucifix with rosary beads that was always wrapped around his wrist. He constantly fidgeted with the crucifix between his fingers. It was like he was always nervous of some unseen force. He would talk to me about my high school, which made me supremely uncomfortable at first, because no one knew where I had gone. It was a private Christian high school in Missouri. He'd talk to me about how I played football and basketball there. We'd have philosophical debates about Christianity, since he was Catholic and I was Protestant. Always respectful and always interesting. I'm not sure when it happened. But he became like an uncle to me. At the end of our conversations, he would always pause and look me in the eye. He wanted to tell me something about the mission, but just couldn't do it. One night, once we were nearly complete with the mission, he came to my hooch late at night. It must have been 0200. The only activity in the COP was soldiers pulling security in the towers and fighting positions. He tells me to ditch my electronics and rubs some sort of wand over me like security in an airport. We then walked outside the COP, which makes me highly uncomfortable. We aren't exactly in Missouri. He walks over to a shallow cavern and drops a few of the orbs we had been leaving around the country. I watch as a small green light comes on on each one. They suddenly roll forward, spacing out and coming to a rest at opposite ends of the cavern. Sitting on a rock, he pulls out his laptop and motions for me to look. It was the cavern we were sitting in. It was like staring at a 300 degree picture online. The cavern was completely mapped out. He moves the joystick steering his way around the cavern. I could see in great detail the granite walls and even the small bugs that were flying around, frozen in mid-air. It finally dawns on me as I look at him. Holy shit, we've been mapping the caves of Afghanistan. Yup, it's not perfect. Some of the deeper caverns have dark spots, but it's a start. My team thinks we've covered about 30% of the cave systems. He says, I'm blown away. This is going to be huge. Bin Laden, Al Qaeda, the Taliban. We're going to make some major progress in the war on terror. 
he looks at me and raises his hand above his head, just like Captain Stone had before battling the giant. Think bigger, he says, grabbing his computer and heading back to camp. The next morning, Jake grabs Vasquez and me, telling us we're going to see a friend. We borrow a vehicle from the Kiwis responsible for the area, driving into a tiny village a couple of hours from the COP. Jake dismounts, motioning for us to follow him into a small home. An elderly Afghan man, long white beard, head wrap on, smiles, saying something in Dari. Jake gives him a hug and responds. We sit down at a table full of traditional Afghan foods. We spend an hour with small talk, Jake translating the entire time. The Afghan elder finally says, You have new friends. You want me to tell them about the beast? Jake nods, looking at me. Asari is the elder of this village and a dear friend of mine. He led me on the path I'm on. He introduced me to the giants when I was about your age, he says. Asari begins his story, Jake translating. My village has always feared the beast. We have always feared the night. We all go inside when the sun sets, even pulling our animals into our homes. He motions toward a goat that is standing outside. The beast has always done what it wanted. No man could stop it. When I was a young man, I thought the elders were just trying to scare us. I had never seen the beast. So, two of my friends and I went to explore the countryside at night. It felt very freeing to no longer fear the stories of my elders. We explored for hours, enjoying the cool air of the night. The grass was wet with dew as we ran up and down the hills near our village. His facial expression changes to sadness. We are at the top of one of the forbidden hills, when we were overcome with a terrible smell. We were all frozen in fear. We feel it in here, he points at his chest. Suddenly, a very large man, like two of us, grabs one of my friends. My friend screams in pain and fear, the beast crushing him, his bones loudly popping. The creature then bites down on my friend, ripping his body in half. He chews the top half, loud cracking with every bite. He swallows and drops his legs on the ground. The beast looks at me, speaking in a language I do not understand. The only word I recognize is my name. It then grabs my other friend, smashing him flat on the ground. Blood pooling underneath, the giant stands over me and yells like a lion. It then grabs what's left of my friends and walks off, chewing on one of their legs as it goes. The elder is crying at this point. He says, I waited every night for the beast to come back for me. Some years, we heard nothing of it. Some years, entire families disappeared from their homes. We always felt the ground shaking and heard the roar like a lion. Every time, I heard my name yelled between the splintering and cracking of homes being destroyed. I was always too afraid to reveal myself. I can still hear the crunching of my friend in its mouth. He then looks at Jake with a small smile. Until Jake, Jake and other Americans found and killed the beast many years ago. I've slept soundly for many years now. We thank Asari for the food and give him gifts. Jake gives him a hug and says the Pashto word for friend as we leave. We head back to the COP, not saying a word. All I could think of was the giant's yellow eyes. My heart pounding with rage for the innocent people of Asari's village. 
The next morning, Jake informs me that we're done mapping for now. He puts his arm around me and walks me around the corner of the sleeping quarters. Mike, I've enjoyed our talks. I informed Lieutenant Colonel Williams that you and Vasquez did an awesome job and that I trust you entirely. He reaches out and slides something in the breast pocket of my ACUs, saying, Go see Lieutenant Colonel Williams before closing the Velcro. John will take you to him. Lieutenant Colonel Williams has a new mission for you. Welcome to M. I must have looked extremely confused. He smiles and gives me one of his patented nerdy fist bumps and walks off. We descend toward a COP in the most remote part of Afghanistan. Jagged mountains litter the landscape, snow covering the peaks. The black ox dips sharply as we pass through two peaks and into a small clearing landing within the walls of a COP. I had just spent the last couple of months flying all around Afghanistan. I never saw this COP or these peaks. I had no idea where we were. It was placed in the most counterintuitive fashion possible. It was at the base of a hidden pass, sheer cliffs all around. There were only a few pilots I knew that would risk landing in a place like that. And we were low on the ground. An enemy ambush would leave us defenseless. The rotor slowly winds down as we step out of the chopper. David is there to meet me. He has a huge smile on his face, which is weird for team guys. His patrol cap off, only his kippa covering his head. Welcome to FOB Exodus, he says, nodding at the helicopter and door gunner. He grabs my back from me and ushers Staff Sergeant Vasquez and I toward the talk, which looks like every other shitty talk in a desolate outpost. Maps and TV screens littering the walls, soldiers sitting at tables, monitoring radios. The odd part is that two huge team guys stand in the back of the talk, each at the low, ready with weapons. All good guys, David says. They push the shelf to the side. It makes a loud, grinding noise as it begrudgingly slides across the floor. Where the shelf used to be is the staircase. I hope you're ready to be tortured, David says with a smile. He motions for us to follow, leading us to a door at the bottom of the stairs. He knocks three times and waits for a voice to call him in. I follow him into a large conference room with a huge table in the middle. Lieutenant Colonel Williams stands in front of a TV screen, conducting some sort of intel brief. A dozen guys sit at the table. I recognize Captain Jones, a few team guys, and a CIA agent from backroom. There were a few SAS officers, two Brits and an Aussie, a Canadian GTF-2 NCO, and an Afghan commando. On the end sat an Israeli commando, who I would later learn served in CRA. The wall has TV screens, dry erase ports, and cork ports. All are littered with pictures of creatures. Most look like the giant we killed, labeled Nephilim or Refine. Other terrifying creatures litter the wall. There are maps with red tracks signifying targets. One corkboard has pictures of what look like angels and Greek gods. It's labeled Watchers or Fallen Angels. Staff Sergeant Vasquez takes a seat at the table, winking at me and smiling. Lieutenant Colonel Williams says, Welcome back, Vasquez. He turns to me and says, Welcome to Task Force M. We decided we can trust you entirely. Are you ready to kill real evil?